Good morning, everyone. Good to see you today. So glad that you're here. Have the opportunity to worship the Lord together. I want to remind you, if you did not grab your communion packet on the way in, now would be a great time to slip back and get that. It's on the table. As you enter the auditorium, we also have mail folders for our regular attenders and members. You want to check those every week and an offering box if you'd like to give. You're welcome to just drop something in on your way in or out. And if you're visiting with us today, we'd love it if you filled out one of our Connect cards in the seat in front of you. You just take it to the Welcome Center. It gives us a chance to follow up with you. Uh, we're not going to uh, harass you. I think Jeff said a few weeks ago, we're not going to call you about your car warranty. But we do have some letters we want to mail you to give you some information about the church family here and give you that opportunity to learn more about us. Number of announcements. Uh, May is on the horizon, and we have a lot of things going on starting this coming weekend. Uh, on Friday night and Saturday up at Camp Wakatomica, all the men and all the boys are invited to come up there for our annual man camp. We've got some great things in store for you there. Make sure you see Larry Weckeser today before you go to give him an indication that you will be there. And then on Saturday morning, our ladies will, will meet here at 9 a.m. We've got a seminar called Woman to Woman, Ministering Woman to Woman. We have a uh, certified professional counselor that will be here and give you some guidance and wisdom and encouraging other women in the faith and through the challenges of life. And if you would, make sure you see Rachel Stone today before you leave and let her know uh, that you will be here so they can prepare for that. Next Sunday after our morning service, we have our congregational meeting and all of our members are invited to stay for that. And then a number of other things coming up uh, for the adults. Uh, next Sunday afternoon, our annual family and youth a fishing tournament will be down at the Buckingham Pond on Hazeldell Road, and so you're invited to stay or to go to that after the uh, congregational meeting. There will be a meal there for you, and then a, a fishing tournament to follow. I also want to let you know that if you are involved in our Sunday school launch party, which is going to be the first week in June, if you're aware of it, you've been asked to be a part of it. Uh, one of the teachers, please stay today after the morning service. Olivia would like to have a short meeting with you. Again, that's for those involved in our launch party for Sunday school. Stay immediately after this morning's uh, assembly. Also, Cora Carrier, uh, she is in a nursing home down in Westerville, but should be coming home this week. We have her address in the bulletin for Westerville, but if you'd like to send her a card, just go ahead and send it to Gary and Rachel Stone's house. And then some new announcements or prayer concerns this morning. Um, Rick Greenwood, that's a neighbor of Helen Truex, Truex. Rick Greenwood, he's in ICU with kidney failure, so we need to be in prayer for Rick and his wife, Gloria. Also be in prayer for Jaretta Walton and Ruth Stokes. Uh, one is an aunt and the other is the neighbor of Brenda Walters. They both had falls this past week and they're in their 90s and they're in a lot of discomfort. And then one last uh, thing to keep in your, your prayer mind, uh, Will and Emily Gaines are going to be moving to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Will's leaving tomorrow to, uh, it's my daughter, if you didn't know, and her husband. Um, but uh, Will's going to be transferring to Tulsa to work. And Emily will be following in the next few weeks. So be in prayer for them as they go through this transition in life. Hey, let's stand together as a church family. Again, we are grateful that we can be here to worship our Lord together. Let's have a time of prayer and then we'll enter into a time of singing. Father God, we stand together amazed in your presence. We're grateful for the truth of your word and the opportunity we have to study it. Grateful that we can come together to fellowship as, as a, a church family and reconnect with one another, and Father, be encouraged for the week ahead. Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to have the Lord's Supper, and pray, God, that our hearts and our minds will be in tune as we approach that time in our service later. And Father, as we come to you in prayer, we're grateful that we can bring our petitions to you and that you care about the big things in life, but also the small things. And God, right now, we just cast our cares upon you. We ask for wisdom and guidance as we minister to those in our lives that have needs. And Father, we pray for those that are physically hurting right now and have emotional, psychological, and spiritual issues. 
that need to be met. Father, we pray that you'll intervene and be their guide and their God in this time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Fighting is common in the animal world. For example, a male lion might fight another male lion to take over his pride. The pride of lions might kill a lion that would wander into its territory to protect it. Here a little more locally, this fall we might uh, remember the, during the rut when the bucks will fight with each other over a doe. And that fighting might result in death. But there's no penalty on earth or in heaven for the death. Thievery is also common in the animal world. Those of us that like to watch those animal shows, you remember seeing the, the cheetah, when it catches a gazelle, will drag it up into a tree so it isn't stolen from another animal. Even chipmunks will fight for territory and they'll steal from each other. They'll go down in the burrows and steal uh, acorns out of the, uh, another chipmunk's uh, storage area. And again, there's no penalty for this thievery in the animal kingdom, neither on the earth or in the heaven. Those same actions, though, by a man does result in sin, and it does result in penalty here on earth and in heaven. Sin is unique to mankind. Sin does not exist outside of mankind. Why? Genesis 127 says that God created man his own, in his own image. That makes us unique. That makes us different. And even in a world that is corrupt or lawless, where if a man were to murder or steal, he didn't have to face punishment here on this earth, he would still face penalty eternally because of sin against God. 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 through 10 says, Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. He referring to Jesus. No one who abides in sin, no one, no one who abides in him sins, no one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, that he might destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Again, those who practice righteousness are children of God, and those who practice sin, children of the devil. In verse 8, it says that the Son of God appeared for the purpose of destroying the works of the devil, to destroy sin. Because our sin is against God, the remedy can only come from God. And of course we know that, that remedy is Christ, who came to destroy the works of the devil, to take away our guilt and the penalty for our sin. That's a significant thing. We consider the life that we live, each of us as sinners, Imagine if we had to carry that burden with us that just continued to grow and to get heavier and heavier if we had no way to remove the guilt of our sin. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30 says, this is Jesus speaking, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. He's talking about heavy laden with sin. And he says, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, my load is light. 
We just sang a song, It Is Well With My Soul. We would not be able to sing that song had not Christ come and died for each one of us. Do we really appreciate and think about the benefit of having that burden lifted from us? The, the penalty that Christ has paid for us? We take this time each week so that we can clear our minds, consider, examine our lives, but mainly so that we can remind ourselves of the great gift that Jesus gave to us through his death upon the cross. Let's pray. Lord God, our mighty, our Father in heaven, Lord, it is such an honor, such a privilege to come before you in prayer. Lord, to take this time to reflect on our lives and to consider your gift, your son, Jesus Christ, his death upon the cross. Father, as we partake of the bread, that we would remember a body that was beaten and broken. As we partake of the cup, remembering blood that you've shed for each and every one of us. And Father, that we can have wellness in our soul because of this great gift. Father, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. like to extend an opportunity to you to learn about counseling woman to woman. We have an accredited counselor, her name is Tracy Waite, here to teach us how to apply practical training with biblical wisdom. Tracy has a lot of training, she's an accredited counselor, she has many, many hours of Christian counseling. She's worked with children, she's worked with adults. We're grateful to have her. We're gonna spend a couple of hours on Saturday morning, May the 1st, from 9 to 11 here at Millwood. Um, she's gonna teach us how to put the two of those together, biblical wisdom and practical training for healthy minds and hearts and souls. Uh, we hope that you'll join us and take this time to learn better how to minister woman to woman. We've sent out flyers to several different churches. My information is on there. Um, we'd like for you to RSVP and let us know how many of you will be joining us so we can be prepared. If you have any questions, my information is on there and you can ask uh, anything that is pertaining to the seminar that uh, maybe you have specific questions about. Also, Tracy is going to open up for us uh, a special time of question and answer. So if you have anything specific that you would like to deal with, go ahead and have that prepared ahead of time. Uh, we're looking forward to meeting all of you and we hope you can join us. grateful Rachel is spearheading that for us. That's an area the elders identified within the past number of years, the need to have women within the body of Christ equipped to help other women in very specific ways. And I think Tracy's going to do a good job in doing that. Ladies, let me do this right now. If you're planning on being here Saturday and you've not yet told Rachel, just grab your cell phone right now and text Rachel 740-501-3439. Make sure your ringer's off, Rachel, and just let her know you're coming. No time like the present, right? Let's do that. And uh, while you're texting, the rest of us are going to go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, we are walking through the book of Ephesians, learning from the Apostle Paul, very important instruction for the church in today's culture, and very much so, we can relate to what they were going through at the time he wrote this 2,000 years ago. He wrote it to a group of Christians, the church at Ephesus, that lived in a very pagan and corrupt and immoral society. They were shocked by the things that were going on around them, much like we can be shocked by the things that we see going on around us as well. And as Paul has walked through this letter with us so far, he has been helping the Christians to form their identity. 
identity formation. It's, it's the kind of concept that we uh, go about with our children as they're being raised from a, the time they're a little baby until the time they walk, until the time they go to school, get a job, go on their first date, begin to drive and, and actually go out into the world one day. We as parents have a responsibility to help shape their identities, for them to become the people that we want them to be. And either knowingly or unknowingly, we are forming who our children are going to become. A number of years ago, I was going through my mom's things after she passed away, and I found this, this photo frame. Maybe some of you had something like this. It was in the shape of, a, of an old schoolhouse. And at the top, there was some sort of steeple with a bell in it, and you just knew it was an old-fashioned schoolhouse. It was red. And there were 12 spots in there. And in each of those 12 spots was a picture of yours truly. Me, from the time I was in first grade to the time that I was in high school and graduated. And over the course of those years, you saw the changes. You know, as a little kindergartner or first grader, I had that typical 1970s bowl cut with the bang straight across the brow. Eventually, by the time I got to junior high school, I had the, uh, the feathered hair, you know. Those were the days when guys would carry combs in their back pockets. Then I got my glasses, and the look of my face really began to change. And as I got older, I would begin to hear comments from family and friends, something like this, boy, you look a lot like your dad. And as I became an adult and moved on in life, I become more and more like my dad as I've grown older. That all started when I was a baby. That's, that's what we would call identity formation. As a little kid, I was being shaped into the person that I would eventually become. If you're quiet here for just a moment, you hear it? There's a noise of a baby. And there's another noise over here. At times, in this auditorium on a Sunday morning, it's pretty loud, especially if you're back in that section. The parents all seem to congregate there. Isn't that great noise? Man, I love that sound. In our congregation right now, and there might be a pregnancy or two out there that I'm not aware of. In our congregation right now, we have nearly 20 children two years old and younger. Isn't that wonderful? When we talk about church growth, our young parents take that to heart. <laughs> and when you go out into the nursery or the we worship area, it is an absolute madhouse. We're doing the best we can to get that under control, to get staffing and figure out what that's going to look like long term. But thank you. Thank you for bringing your children and thank you for worshiping with your young ones. And thanks to the ladies and teenage ladies that are out there serving in our nursery and we worship area. They're the ones who deserve some applause on a Sunday morning, if they can hear us. But you know, by the time my first picture showed up in first grade on that frame, I was who I was probably going to be in much of my character at that point in life. My parents had taught me as a little boy what to touch and not to touch, what to say and not to say, how to treat other people and how not to treat other people at times. And so when I started going off to school and I might come home and tell a story to my mom and dad about the way a certain kid in class would act, they'd say, now that wasn't good, was it? Because that's not the way we act, is it? And so by the time I was six or seven years old, much of my character had already been established. Though I would continue, hopefully, to mature and to grow and to become the man that I have become, much of who I am today was established when I was a little, a little boy. So that by the time I went on my first date, and I remember it very distinctly, standing in the kitchen with my mom and dad, you talk about awkward and my mom is standing there telling me how to treat a woman. And it hit me, I didn't need this lesson because my dad had been showing me my whole life how women are to be treated. And when I went out into the real world and got my first job, I didn't need my dad to sit there and tell me to go and work hard because he had shown me what it was to work hard. 
He had shaped my identity through his example. And that's what the Apostle Paul is trying to help the Ephesian church and the church here at Millwood to understand. Over the first few chapters, we've studied what it is to be a Christian, how to become a Christian. We've looked at the identity that we have in Christ and as children of the living God. We've looked at what it is to be unified as the body of Christ, to walk by the Spirit, to be people that contribute to the work of the church, that we're united in the work that we do, and we're building up the church together. That identity formation has occurred in the first three and four chapters of the book of Exodus so that by the time we get to Ephesians chapter 5, he's about to open the door and say, go out into the world. All of the things we've talked about so far has been your identity formation so that as you go out into the real world, now you know how to walk. You know who you are and how you act, what to say what to touch, what not to touch, who to spend time with, and how your life can change the world one way or another. And so in verse one of chapter five, he sums it all up in this way. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Imitate God, Ephesians 5.1. Imitate God, mimic God. We had our granddaughter over the other day and all of us are sitting around the table and a few people started to make these faces and to make these noises. Guess what she started to do? Make those faces and make those noises. Why? Because she's imitating what she sees. We were being very intentional in trying to be silly. But a lot of times in our unintentional efforts to raise our children, we forget that they're watching us all the while. You ever gone by a pond somewhere out in the country or maybe even in in town, they'll have a pond here and there. And there's a a mama duck and behind her is waddling along little ducklings. And they jump in the pond and one after one after one, they get in the pond and they swim around in a single file line. The ducklings are mimicking what their mama duck is doing. They're following after her. And that's what the apostle Paul says, mimic God. Follow after God, be like God, imitate God. And what does God specifically say? Be holy as I am holy. You know, a lot of times in the church, we have a mindset that God's highest desire for us individually is to be happy, right? That I've become a Christian. I've been baptized into Christ. I do the best I can. I walk faithfully. I go to church every week and I deserve to be happy. And then we're almost shocked when things don't always go the way we planned. When maybe we're driving along the road and somebody T-bones us and we're in an accident and we find ourselves in the hospital for a period of time. Or we go to the doctor thinking everything's fine and they give us news that wasn't so good and the next thing you know, we're spending the next year in treatment of some sort. We're going along in our lives and we brought our kids to church every single week and they reach adulthood and begin to make their own serious choices for themselves and they walk away from the faith. And we begin to think to ourselves, God, I don't deserve this. I've done all the right things. Don't I deserve to be happy? Well, the perspective that God has about our lives isn't so much oriented around our happiness as it is our holiness being like him, imitators of him, knowing what he desires and what his will for our lives is. How do we do that? God's in heaven. He's an eternal being. He's the creator of the universe. He sustains all things. God is huge and we are just people. How can we be like God? How can we follow after God who reigns eternally on a throne, has angelic beings worshiping him day and night, nonstop throughout all of eternity? How do we imitate a God like that? By imitating his son, Jesus Christ. By mimicking what Jesus Christ did when he lived here on our planet. What Jesus Christ did for us, the way he lived, the way he acted, the things that he said, his heart toward other people, his sacrifice for all people. So we are to reflect our father God through the life of Jesus Christ, his son. I heard years ago, and I'm sure some of you guys have heard this as well, before you decide to get married to a a young lady, 
make sure you get to know her mom. Because that's probably what your wife is going to be like one day. Well, I'll tell you what, when I was dating Andrea and I met her mom for the first time, I thought, I've hit the jackpot. And for those of you that know my mother-in-law, wonderful woman. And she's raised wonderful daughters who serve their families well. Why can they do that? Because they've imitated their mother. They watched their mother all those years. My guess is moms and dads don't generally sit down and and define what your day-to-day lives are going to be like, the words you're going to say, and how you're going to act in every single situation. Rather, they model for their children the way to respond and the things to say. And that's what we have to keep in mind as parents. Our kids are always watching. They're always observing. And so as a side note, and we'll get to parenting in a few weeks, but as a side note, as God the Father, through Jesus Christ, he exampled for us, he modeled for us the kind of people we're to be. And as parents, are we modeling for our children the kinds of people that we want them to be, and we know that God wants them to be one day as well. And so Paul says, be imitators of God. Elsewhere in Scripture, in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, he says, follow Jesus, or follow me as I follow Christ. He's saying, be an imitator of me because I am following Jesus. And that means that I'm not just going to be a Christian on Sundays, but every day of the week. I'm not just going to be a good person in church, but everywhere I go. I'm not just going to say the right things at home, but everywhere I go, whether it's work or school, imitate God. How do we do that? Walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Walk like Jesus Walked. The idea of walk here isn't new to us, is it, as we've studied through Ephesians? We know the idea of walking is the lifestyle that we have, the, the manner of life, our daily living, day in and day out. That's what we're doing. We walk through our lives. We're going about our lives. And he's saying, as you go about your lives, imitate God. It's our way of life. And so the Christian life is modeled after Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the absolute and highest example of love. Walk in love. That idea of love in our culture and for many of us is is a little bit skewed, isn't it? For example, if you were to ask me what my favorite food is, I've got a a short list of favorite foods, but right up there is going to be velvet mint chocolate chip ice cream, if you're taking notes. I love Velvet mint chocolate chip ice cream. And there's a bunch of other ice creams I love too. I love, like many of you, the Ohio State Buckeyes. I love watching sports. I love going to the stadium and and getting a hot dog. I love hot dogs at the stadium and that mustard that's just different than anything else you can buy. I love that. And I love my wife and kids. Does that fit? Does that idea of love fit? All of those foods and activities that I love to do, does it fit with the idea that I love my wife and my children? No, it doesn't. But here in English, we have the same word that represents so much that it's almost become watered down to the point that when you're in a relationship with a Uh, A little boy, little girl are in a relationship together and they write notes to each other in class. I love you. Do you love me? Yes box, no box. Check off which one. Do they know what love is? Uh, To some extent, but really they just like the other person. And then you get to high school and you see that girl down the hall. She has a locker not too far from you and you think, man, I love her. Better word is probably lust there. And then we have all these other things that we love in life and we mature and we find a spouse and and we stand at the altar before a preacher and in front of a bunch of people and say, I love this, this person with my whole being. But in that first day of marriage, you really don't have any understanding of what true love is, do you? Compared to 25 years later or more. 
because you've experienced life together. And so when the Apostle Paul writes to walk in love, he's not talking about the kinds of food you love or the girl that you like. He's talking about a, a love that can be only associated with God. It's a love so pure and a love so perfect, perfect that only God gives us a true picture of what that love is. In the Greek, that word is agape. You've probably heard that word before, agape love. In the Greek, there's different words that represent the kind of love that you might have for people. There's that godlike love. There's a romantic love that does exist between a husband and wife. There's a brotherly love that exists. And then there's a friendship kind of love, that, that phileo, city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, that kind of love. And so the language for us has been very specific. And the word that is used here is a very specific word word. It's not talking about walking in like with other people. It's not even talking about being good friends with other people. It's not even talking about being good brothers and sisters within the Lord's church. It's talking about walking in a love that only God can picture for us. That agape love, it's a, a pure love that ultimately is expressed not in how you feel, not even in what you say, but only in what you do. True love defined is thinking the best, but also doing the best for another person. And so that agape love, that perfect God-like love, is not simply a word, but it's a work. It's not an emotion, it's an action. It's not just forever, but it is eternal. And it is pictured for us in Jesus Christ. Jesus in John 15, 12 said, love one another as I have loved you. In 1 John 3, 16 and following, we know, by, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. But whoever has worldly goods and sees his brother or sister in need and closes his heart against them, how does the love of God remain in him? Little children, let's not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. True love is only seen in the doing. How do you love other people? Jesus gives us a, an idea of what true love is, not so much in that he forgave sins while he walked here on the earth, though that's a part of it. Not so much that he healed people, though, man, isn't that incredible? It's not so much that he was patient with his apostles and patient with so many people as they made him angry from time to time. But Jesus' love in its purest form is defined when he is hanging on the cross, shedding his blood for our sin. That's a self-sacrificing love. A little bit later in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church and gave himself up for her. And so for most of us men, let's just be honest, loving our wives seems easy because of who they are, right? They're good women. They serve us well. They care about other people. They have sacrificed much. But living it out at times can be a challenge, not because of who they are, but because of who we are. Because all of us, at some level, are selfishly oriented. We like to focus on ourselves and get what we want and have our needs met. But we are called to walk in love. Walk in love, even when we're not what we need to be, or at times, even when another person isn't who they ought to be either. In Matthew chapter 5, starting, at, starting in verse 43... Matthew 5, 43 and following, this is, the, this is the Sermon on the Mount. So this is the sermon where Jesus is sitting and talking to all kinds of people and giving them an amazing amount of instruction. And within that, he says these words, Matthew 5, 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your enemy, or excuse me, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That makes sense to us, doesn't it? To love your neighbor, love your neighbor, he's a good guy. Every once in a while, his wife might bake a pie and bring it over to the house. Sometimes he might come over and help you cut down a tree and drag it, drag it off your property. 
There's good things about most of our neighbors. I know not everybody has good ones. But we should love our neighbors. That makes sense. Those are the people we want to be around. But hate your enemy. Oh, that's logical. Hate your enemy. Why? Because they've hurt you. They've said that bad things about you. They've done bad things to your family. And sometimes you just don't like the person. And so Jesus says, that's what you've been told for generations. Love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. Why? Because that makes sense. Jesus, though, says, I say this. Love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you, so that you may prove yourselves to be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For you love those who love you. What reward is that for you? Even the tax collectors, do they not do the same? Tax collectors were the most hated people in this culture at that time. And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Even the Gentiles, do they not do the same? Therefore, you shall be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. God said, be holy as I am holy. Jesus said, be perfect as your Father is perfect. And Jesus associates that concept of being like God with the concept of loving even your enemies. The Bible tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died on the cross. Christ knew. He knew everyone and everything. And some of us are downright despicable people, aren't we? Yet he still went to the cross. And as he's hanging on the cross, he says, forgive them. They know not what they do. Could you do that? Wow. We have a hard enough time forgiving the guy who cuts us off in in busy traffic. We have a hard enough time forgiving uh, when somebody at work cheats and at our expense. We have a hard enough time when our boss doesn't treat us the way that we deserve. But Jesus says, those are the people you're to love. It's easy to love the lovable, isn't it? All these little kids roaming around here. They do things that maybe we're not always happy with, but we always love them. Why? Because they're kids. They're lovable. But if an adult does those things, we write them off. We talk about them. We slander them. We exclude them however we can. Jesus says, no, 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 no. Don't do that. Love them. Love them to a point that you're willing to sacrifice for their benefit. Love means that we want the best and we do the best for other people even if that other person is someone we don't like or somebody that's hurt us. Look at verses 3 and following again back in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5, 3. But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named amongst you as is proper among the saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ in God. And so Paul here helps us understanding something very important. Love isn't just doing good things. Love is also expressed by not doing evil things. Isn't it pretty incredible that God loved us even while we were doing evil things? with the hopes that one day we would repent. That's not where he wants us to stay. And we have to be careful of abusing that grace that God extends to us. But we have to understand and grab a hold of a very important concept as we continue to live in a culture that is becoming increasingly corrupt and that we love to point the finger at. That we cannot continue to live in sin and evil without the expectation that eventually God is going to punish us in eternal judgment. That's what he says. No immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ in God. Gary this morning referenced 1 John chapter 3. 
1 John 3 helps us understand the point when we might lose our salvation is the point when we are continually practicing sin or we're walking in a lifestyle of sin without the intent of repentance. Our hearts have become hardened. We are content to live where we are because it feels good in the moment or we feel too guilty to come and ask for forgiveness. But ultimately, what we have to understand is if we continue to live that way, we will not inherit eternal life. God wants our holiness more than he wants our happiness. But we've often exchanged our happiness. We've bought into the idea that we deserve to be happy and we've set aside holiness. And so he says specifically here, there's some things. Sexual immorality, sinful activities, foul humor. Those are the kinds of things that show God that, that we don't love him. That we're not connected to him. That we really disregard what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Hebrews 6.6 6 puts it this way, that it's as if we are putting Christ back on the cross every time we do those things. And we become like a child who has had his identity shaped by his parents, we become like that child who, when you reach an age that's old enough, you just walk away from everything they've taught you. Last week, we talked about this some, those sinful habits that we're to put off and the things that we're to be putting on. We put away lying and put on truthfulness. We put away sinful anger. We replace it with forgiveness. We put away greed and we replace it with generosity. You see, instead of walking in love, oftentimes what we have found in our lives is that we prefer to have a life on the edge. Where we haven't really put those things off, we maybe just store them in a side pocket for a while. And when we feel like getting back into it, we pull it out again. You know what that life could be like. You've got a set of friends that, that are churchy people, religious people, and those are the people that you're here with this morning, and, and we put on a good show for those people. Then we've got another set of friends, and we act entirely different around them. Around our churchy friends, you know, we're going to clean up. We're not going to use bad language, but around our, our, our worldly friends, the old friends, we're just going to talk about what they talk about and laugh at what they joke about. Paul's saying here, there's going to be a difference in who you are because you want to have an impact on the culture in which you live. You've got to live differently than the culture that you're trying to influence. But we want to live on the edge in that way. We want to reserve a, a holy life, a sacred life, and a secular life. And in doing so, we end up too often living on the edge. God says to walk in love. That's a, that's a walk that's confident. That's a walk that defines who you are. That's a day in and day out mindset of who you are, who you identify with, and how you're going to go about your life. And oftentimes what we end up doing, though, is we run up to the edge as it relates to our old life and sin. You know, I used to get drunk, and, and I, I'm still going to hang out with the buds who, who drink a little bit. Just give me a beer. I'll, I'll just drink one beer, but I'm not going to get drunk. I'm just going to live on that edge. There's a girl that, you know, we had a relationship for a while and it was inappropriate and immoral. Boy, she's sweet. She's a sweetheart. And I love her. And I just, I just need to spend a little time with her just to let her know we're still friends. And maybe I'll win her to Jesus. That life on the edge. You, you take one step and what happens? I'm down there. But our lives, what... Paul says in Galatians chapter 5 is we walk in the spirit. We are holy people. We are set apart people, sanctified people because we are indwelt by the spirit of God, aren't we? Right? Aren't we? As Christians, we're indwelt by the spirit of God. And that spirit of God needs to take authority in our lives. And we give authority to God as we walk through our lives. The apostle Paul here says, put off sexual immorality. I mean, we could identify all kinds of sexual immorality that has been embraced in our society today. We've got adultery, fornication, which is living with another person before you're married. Uh, we've got pornography. We've got homosexuality, transgenderism. There's even pretty nasty stuff beyond that. And it's being advanced in the news. Don't live on the edge. A lot of us say, well, psh, I'd never do some of that crazy stuff. Transgenderism, never get involved with that. Hey, where's that girl? 
Paul says you can't do that. You put that off. You put off one form of sexual immorality. You put off all forms of sexual immorality. I'd never get involved in an illicit relationship with somebody that's not my spouse. But late at night, after the dark, when everybody's in bed, I'm checking out the porn on my phone or computer. That's living on the edge. Paul says, no, no, no. That's not the way you live. That's the way you may have lived once, but that's not the way you live now. Why? Because you want to have an impact on the culture in which you live. You want to be upfront and honest with those with whom you work and people that you're trying to influence for Jesus Christ. He even says in this passage of Scripture here, these things should not even be named among you. What he's talking about there isn't that we don't talk about those things. What he's referring to there is those things shouldn't even be named among you. In other words, your character and your integrity, the way you live your life, should be so upfront that as people look at you, they could not believe you would ever involve yourself with something like that. Spotless. It's not even named when certain people are mentioned. I couldn't imagine this individual doing that. He's saying you've got to be that kind of person. And then he goes on and talks about coarse jesting and those things. He's saying here, not even just a purity of action, but a purity of speech is required as well. Our speech should reflect our values. Our speech should reflect our values. And so as Paul is telling us this, he's helping us understand way back in Ephesians, your identity, you're in Christ That idea of being in Christ or being defined by Christ is repeated 30 times in the book of Ephesians. You're in Christ. This is how you live. This is how you walk. This is who you are. You are in Christ. You have no identity except for Christ. So quit looking in the past. Just look toward Christ in all things. And look at verse 6. Verse 6 of chapter 5, Ephesians. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So don't be deceived by anyone who says, I can still practice sin and go to heaven. That's what he's saying here for us. Don't be deceived by that idea that you could still be involved in sin and still go to heaven. Don't be deceived, young ladies, by that boyfriend who says, if you really love me, you will... Fill in the blank. Don't be, don't be deceived by those friends in school who say, if you, if you really want to be our friend, then you will do this with us on Friday and Saturday. Don't be deceived when you're going through marriage trouble and you're sitting at lunch with a coworker who's not a Christian and they say, you know what you ought to do? Just leave him. He's no good for you anyway. You're not happy and you deserve to be happy. He says, don't be deceived. Don't, 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 don't be deceived by those concepts because they are not biblical. They are not of God and they don't represent who you are in Christ. Certainly God is love. God is love. But anyone who does not repent from their immorality will spend an eternity in hell. And so Paul says, don't be deceived. Don't let anybody confuse you and think that you can still go to heaven And not be the person that God wants you to be. Walk in love. It's not just, it's not just a love that that shows others how much we like them, but it's a love that is defined by a love that God gives. It's self-sacrificial. And it's a love that obeys God. Second John 1 6, this is love that we walk according to His commandments. And so this walking in love is one aspect of being a godly person. It's one aspect of who Paul is helping us to understand who we need to be. It's one aspect as we have formed our identities in Christ that we are going to exhibit to those around us. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son for us. That's where we need to look to Christ for our example of love. And so we love God by doing what's right and obeying his commandments. Simple question for you here to conclude. How much do you love God? Do you love God to obey what God has commanded you to do? 1 Thessalonians 5, 3 says, his commands are not burdensome. If we truly rely upon God, God will see you through it and guide you as you go. Let's pray.
Our Heavenly Father, as we come to you, we give you thanks. You're a holy and an awesome God. And Father, we fall far short of your holiness, but that's what you've required of us is to be holy as you are holy. And so for that, God, we are in fear because we know when we don't measure up, we don't go to heaven and we go to hell. But because of Jesus Christ's work on the cross, we know, God, that his holiness can intervene on our behalf. And so, God, I pray for each one that's here today that we'll live as people whose lives have been changed by Jesus Christ. And for those who are outside of Christ, that they'll do what they need to do today, Father, to come inside of your will and to be in Christ from this point forward. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as a church family. If you're not inside of Christ, the Bible makes it clear. You're baptized into Christ. You've put on Christ. You're in Christ. You're a new creation. You walk in newness of life. If you've never done that before, if you've never become a Christian, or if you have questions about your next steps of faith, we want you to take action this morning. Come up front, talk to me, talk to me after, or if you're ready for that action, we'll make it happen today. This is driven by kings. You cover the mountains, the valleys below with the breath of your mighty wings. All treasure
Heavenly Father, we pray now that you will send us forth from this place as your church gathered together, that we might be aware that your spirit lives in us, that we might be your hands and your feet, your voice, your compassion to a lost and a hurting world. And now, Father, unto him who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only God, our Savior, be all glory, dominion, and power now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. This how